So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Felix Kremer. I'm from the Max Planck Institute of Biogeochemistry in Jena. And I'd like to uh, show you how we use um, the yaxarays.jl Jula package to do large scale raster computations. So, first, I want to First, I want to talk shortly about why we're using Julia. So it's a an highly interactive language like Python and R, but it can achieve very high speeds like, like C. Um, therefore, most of the packages that we use are written in Julia, so there's a very low barrier to dive into the deeper packages, um, into the deeper package stack that you're using. And I think that's also a good um, case for reproducibility because you can you don't have this barrier between your high level code like you have in python and r where you have parts of the packages in python and then you have underlying packages in c um here you have um, basically everything in the same language and but of, there are some caveats of um, using julia um it's a relatively young language so the first open source release of the packet of the language was 10 years ago and the first stable version that we're still on is um, five years old therefore it has a much smaller ecosystem compared to python or r because it's much younger therefore there, you have more rough edges um, that are currently smoothed out um, so if you if you use it and you find some rough edges please open issues be it there's missing documentation, there's confusing documentation, or there's just some errors that are popping up or some things that could be done better. Um, so why are we using the Yaxarays package? So it's similar in scope of the X-Array package. So it's, um, you can do raster data processing with named access. It can use data which is larger than RAM. It only loads the data that is really needed for the current computation. It uses the internal chunking of the data to um, only load parts of it and then pre process that and save, save it somewhere. And you can use um, NetCDF, SAR, or basically everything that is openable by GDAL to load data either locally or from cloud storage. Um, so now I first want to explain a bit what, what is chunking and why is it important. So the data is stored on your machine in certain chunks, so in data that is contiguous, and this can have different um, chunking. So you can have either map, map data so that you're, you're layer by layer um, saving the data, or if you have a data cube with a spatial domain and some temporal domain you can also save every time step by uh, every time series by itself and so if we just load the um, data that is saved as, as map layers and then we can we just um, so there's there's a chunking so you have a map of 1440 by 720 pixels and we have one map for every time step and if we access one map, it's quite fast. If we access only one time se series, which is less data, but because it's in a map chunking, this takes forever. And, and this is because the NetCDF file needs to be open for every um, chunk. So it has to decompress the whole everything to get this one time series. If we now load the data in a box chunking, so we have not the whole map, but we have a 90 by 90 layer of one year of data, we see that loading a map takes a bit more time because now you have to open more chunks, which you didn't have to open before, but loading one time series is much faster. So there's these trade-offs between what should your chunking structure be and um, this depends on 
what is your main analysis that you're going to use on your data. Um, if we now want to do statistics on this data, so if you do, if you take the mean over the whole dimension, so either in, in time dimension or spatially, we see that there's no, not much difference because the mean is a reduction function, so you don't need to hold the whole data set in memory to do the computation of the mean. So you can um, achieve this quite similar performance. But if you now want to compute the median for which you need the whole time series, because you have to order it and to get the me to get the median, we see that doing this only for a four by four window on the map chunking takes 100 seconds. And um, so doing it for the whole data set would not be feasible. One solution to do this, to, to circumvent this problem is to not load every time series by itself and do the computation, but load a whole chunk of data, load one gigabyte of data into memory, do the processing for everything, save it somewhere, take the next one and, and go through all, all the data step by step. And here we just compute the ranges that we could load into memory if we would like to do this computation in one gigabyte steps. And here we see that now the computation, which took 100 seconds for four pixels, takes three, roughly four minutes for the whole data set. And this is basically what the Yaxarays package is doing in the background. But it's not only, it's not just loading the data randomly, but it's, it's loading as many chunks as it can fit into the maximal cache you can provide at the same time so that you can do the computations. And um, so here we see that now the whole computation just takes um, a minute and 10 seconds. And um, <clears throat> so what you could do is to avoid the slow data access is you could rechunk your data if you know that you have to do similar analysis over and over again. So if you know I'm going to use this data set for the next month and I'm always going to use some time series analysis, it might make sense to just pay the chunking cost once and save it somewhere on disk and also pay the disk costs basically, because you also have to then save the data twice if you also need the other chunking. Um, so in Yaxa ways, there's this, there's this easy way of um, set the chunking. So you can just use set chunks and then you can provide the chunk length for every dimension and then you can basically save this somewhere. And then if we, if we now do the computation, because it's in a much better chunking, it only takes 40 seconds. And um, it's therefore uh, much more feasible to do. Um, five minutes, five minutes 50. Ish. But I mean, you're, you're only taking, you're, you're only paying this once. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah just to so come. Yeah. Sorry. Um, now, I, and now I want to um, continue with a general introduction to Yaxarays and the uh, functionality it provides. So, um, so by the way, if if you have any questions, just um, interrupt me and. We can discuss this, right? So we first want to um, load the relevant packages. Um, now we're loading the data with this cube function. We can also load this as a data set. Um, this is basically the um, a system data lab uh, data set, which I pre-saved on my machine because um, I could, 
I could also access the data that is hosted somewhere on the internet, but then I would have strange timings because of um, internet access and so on. So um, this is all going to be locally. So we have now a 1440 by 720 spatial domain. Um, I think 30, 30 ish years of date of, of time, time series data and uh, five variables. And um, then Yaxos has this map cube function where you can apply, either you can apply functions along a single axis. So here we want to apply the median again. So it's just you specify the input dimension, which is time in this case, but you could also do, do it on latitude, longitude. Um, then there's this outdoms, which is empty. So it's, it's a reduction. So there's no output dimension. And then we, we just filter missing and none, and then we um, compute the median. And then we apply this function on, on the variable, on the, on the data cube. And here we just filter by the, the only, to only do it on the temperature data. And now um, this takes a minute and 20 seconds, but, um, and then you can just uh, see that, okay, this is now the median temperatures for Italy um, over the whole time series. And now you see that the, the ra value range is between 280 and 300 something. So that shouldn't be Celsius, hopefully. And so we can also apply a, a function on every single element to convert the data from Kelvin to Celsius. And this, this map function will only apply the function so it's basically only registering the, the function and then it will only apply it once you do something else with the data. So be it either plotting or doing another map cube operation or saving the data to disk. Um, so, and then it's basically the same map, but uh, the value range is in, in Celsius. And, um, we can also do much, much more complicated examples of applying a function with multiple, either multiple input cubes or multiple output cubes or some combination of both. So here we are computing the normalized time series of, a t of, of, a of the data, but we are also saving the mean and standard deviation so that we could reuse it later. And um, so here we have this TS out. So this is one output, there's another output, and then, and then we have the input. And then we have this, um, we have basically multiple um, assignments in the inner function so that we can just assign the, these multiple outputs. And then um, it's to apply it, we define the input dimensions as time and then the output dimensions. And here you can also see that you can directly save the data to a, on disk to a certain path and specify the um, out, output backend. Um, and then we have this tuple of output dimensions and then we apply the, the norm function, which we defined earlier on the whole Thing. And I mean, this is now very fast because it's only on Italy and it's a very um, coarse data set, uh, coarse resolution, so um, it should be very small. But um, yeah, you can basically combine this to get arbitrary functions applied on your data. And yeah, that's then the standard deviation for the land surface temperature on Italy and then you want to go? Now Daniel, Daniel is going to take over. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Daniel and I'd like to present a more or less uh, real world um, example of how to use uh, YAX arrays in a Julia package um, to create um, a so-called vector cube. 
So in this example, um, we try to um, rearrange um, points um, originally having uh, longitude and uh, latitude into one spatial dimension. Um, thinking about zip codes instead of longitude and latitude. So this is a transformation taking two spatial dimensions as an input and giving one spatial dimensions, i.e. Um, the region as an output. So um, let's start by um, creating a traditional um, data cube with uh, values being stretched over longitudes and uh, latitudes. And um, then in order to um, get a data cube um, having not only um, longitude and latitudes, but um, states or country names um, as a spatial um, dimension. We are following um, basically a map reduce um, approach. So there's um, two steps. The first step is um, to create a function called get region, um, which returns uh, the region for every point um, of this uh, raster data cube. And uh, once we know which uh, point of longitude and latitude um, belongs to a certain region, we can then aggregate all of these values um, together, resulting in a vector cube having just one spatial dimension. And then we can um, query those points um, like um, instead of using latitude and longitude um, with uh, region identifiers. So we see here that the mean value about Europe is about four and the mean value about America is about 1.3. And it seems um, feasible um, that um, values in Europe um, are higher in this toy example data sets. I um, want to emphasize the word uh, toy here because um, currently the get region uh, function is um, just querying bounding boxes. Bounding boxes in raster data cubes um, are very easy uh, to implement. You just need um, to have your two intervals. And this is um, not a real world um, example of um, using um, this functionality. So let's continue with a little bit uh, more complex um, example about countries. Um, the um, first step of MapReduce, so the MapReduce, the map, here it's um, just um, calculating all of these uh, region um, labels for all of these longitudes and latitudes. And we can just create this uh, matrix in a different uh, way if we want to have it not for rectangular bounding boxes, but for um, real polygons of country border. So we're starting by um, downloading um, the shape files of all of the um, countries. And then we can um, use uh, the rasterize um, function um, to rasterize our um, shape files in the same grid as it would be um, created um, by the values um, I showed you a few minutes um, earlier. And then we are ending up um, with a matrix um, giving us a zero when it's um, not in one of the selected countries and um, a different value for each country. And this is basically provides us um, the mapping um, to do the transformation again, ending up with um, just one um, data cube, having as one spatial dimension, the region with Italy or elsewhere. This is an example of um, just extracting one bounding box, one country. We can also do this several times. And this is um, also what I'd liked about this um, Julia programming languages. So you, by utilizing um, the broadcast functionality, you can um, run the same process again and again um, for all of the other countries, giving up um, a data cube, having other countries as well. So at the end, uh, we result uh, mean values about each country. In um, another um, Julia package, I'm currently, yes, sure. Um, why is that um, I don't know Julia language so well, but why is that specific to the Julia language that you can choose uh, these different countries? 
So in uh, Julia, we have uh, built-in functionalities um, to apply a function um, to every element um, of a collection. Of course, you can also do this in Python and other languages, um, but um, Julia is designed um, to have uh, native support for these parallelizations. Um, another um, type of um, vector cube um, are so-called uh, discrete global grid systems. So here's a Julia package um, I'm currently um, writing and I'm also going to present it in the coffee poster sessions um, tomorrow afternoon. And here the spatial dimension is uh, not the country, but um, cells like um, hexagons um, that um, tessellate um, the entire surface of the Earth um, with um, each hexagon having the same um, area. And um, this is um, a data structure uh, which is um, good when it um, comes to do machine learning so that um, your kernel, um, for instance, is not being confused with all of the different uh, projection errors and the distortions that can be different in higher latitudes, for instance. So, um now I'm going to continue with um, other functionalities in Luxray. So um, another way um, thing you want you may want to do is to apply functions on moving windows. So um, here we uh, just do a mean filter along um, in a in a box uh, basically, and we can we can just do this um, spatially. So here you can apply. You, you say, okay, I want a moving window in the longitude or and the latitude uh, dimension with with a with three pixels before and three after, so it's a seven by seven grid, and uh, and then um, <coughs> you can apply this on the uh, as as you would apply um, the other map cube functionality. So. Um, just by changing the input dimensions, you change the uh, the way you your data is selected. So um, then we get an input, and I didn't show the map. Okay, and um, you could also um, now um, a more you can also have a more complicated example where you would like to have a not because now we basically either kept the dimensions or reduced the amount of dimensions, but you can also add new dimensions by applying your inner function. And here we just have the GPP data and um, we want to do a decomposition in time into seasonal trend and remainder uh, data. Something didn't work out. So. Um, so here we see that the data, so the, the original data, then you have some seasonality, you have some trend component, and then you have the noise down below. And then um, if we, and now we want to do this in, on every, not, not on a single, so, so in every time series. And we want to here, um, basically we want to save the scale in, in a new dimension, so that you would have go from a spatial times and time cube to a spatial time and time and decomposition scale cube, and so we define this function and then um, we apply this, and here we see that now we have we have a seven hundred by three by um, some I think that's the size of Italy. Um, function, uh, a data cube, so you, we added this new scale dimension to the data cube. And um, we can also interpolate the data on finer grids, so if you would have um, different data sets on different grids, which are, uh, so for example, some coarse um, climate data and some high resolution um, land cover data, you can interpolate one to the other. So um, here we're using the ESDC again. So we have this air temperature and then we just increase the spatial resolution from 
I think 0 0.5 to 0 0.1 degree with this spatial interop. Um, and then you can apply, you can specify an order of the interpolation and then um, you, you can, so this is the original air temperature data and then we apply this interpolation and then you see that uh, basically the it's all fine resolution and you can also apply this on time series data like this here. Not showing. so here you see that going from a, so we basically go from this modest time series good to daily data and um, now we see the yellow points are the actual data points and the blue ones are the um, quadratic interpolations of the data. And um, why is this not? And you can just, and so sometimes you might have your analysis already in Python or R and you could, you could easily um, call your Python or R code as an inner function in Yaxarays. So you can, just as an example, here we call um, SciPy to do a smoothing, but you can basically call whatever Python function with PyCall or R functionality with R call. And um, so, so here we use the SciPy and the image functionality in the inner function. And then we can use the Yaxaway framework to apply it on the whole data set. And, um, so here's the, then this is then the smoothing. Um, and then another uh, nice feature of Yaxo is, is that you can use quite easily the um, multi-processing, either multi-threading or distributed. Um, so you can plan or you can, you can test your, your things on your local machine. And then you can easily also uh, use cluster managers like Slurm to then parallelize your data um, by just using this add prox. For Slurm, there's a bit more, you have to specify your processes outside, but then it's basically, it's very similar. And then it's just going to, you have to activate your functionality in on every worker. And then you can just apply your map cube functions and Yaxarays is going to use the resources that you provided to parallelize the whole processing. Um, now I want to shortly give a give an example of now we I mean for now I just used already pre-made data cubes. Now I want to shortly give an example of how I built um, data cubes from SAR data. With, with the use of uh, GDAL VLTs. So um, we can combine multiple TIFF files into one data cube for then, then for time series analysis, just here as an example of uh, Sentinel-1 data. So first we load the, the packages, then we load uh, the relevant data. So I have a folder with Sentinel-1 data where I want to load the VH polarization and so then I have a list of um, paths to the data and then I um, pass the data, the, the dates of the timestamps from, from the, the file names and then I have this list and here you see that uh, some of these timestamps are really close by and then you have a, have a larger gap. And, um, now we also sort it just as a safety step, basically. And now we, we, we group the data together because the, the timestamps that are nearby are not separated images, but actually they are just acquired at the same time, but are cut for pre-processing purposes. And now here we just um, group them together if they are closer than some threshold. And now we have this group of data files, which we then can load with ArchGDA, which is a Julia wrapper for the GDA functionalities. And now we use um, G 
GDAR build GDAR VLTs to mosaic the data together in space, and then we we save it again, and then we use a use the VLT file again on this on these via the spatial VLTs to get a time series, and then after that we can basically use this as a as a data set to co combine this into a data cube which we then can use to either save into a ZAR file with the proper chunking for time series analysis or for doing some analysis later on. Um, if you're interested into more details in how I'm using this, I'm going to give a talk about uh, forest change detection um, where I'm basically using the, also using YAX arrays and all of this to um, do the computation on Friday. Yeah, and now, um, yeah, you, you can also then set the chunks and save the chunks in on disk. Yeah, and that's it. So I'm happy for questions. Thanks, very uh, nice presentation, very interesting to see a completely different uh, programming language here. I think it's in general looks very similar to what we do with X-Array and also Dask with the last pass for the parallelization. So I was mainly wondering if you did some performance comparisons for this uh, because you say it's much quicker. So I, I'm, I mean, that's your main argument, which I understand for using this. So I was just wondering if you have some comparisons, maybe at different scales, different amounts of data or something like this to... Uh, we didn't do proper comparisons to XOA yet. So what I meant is that, so in your inner function is much quicker because you can use for loops and everything in Julia. So um, in contrast to, I think if you, if you, if you're using the stuff that is implemented in XOA already, and that can be parallelized by X-Array, then it's, I think there won't be much difference because I think it's going to be very similar in what machine code is going to be executed in the end. But sometimes you don't have this and then you, and I also heard that some, so Fabian, my colleague, is, has been running into problems in using X-Array because the processing graph was too large to be even computed or resolved and then and then in Yaxue some 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 of these things could have, have been done in Yaxue then, which haven't been possible in XOA. But we still have to do proper comparisons, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for this interesting presentation and it's really interesting to see all of these functionalities in just in one package. And one of my main questions already Alex asked because it's really hard decision to start using this package because you have to move to another language, not just shifting the package. And another question, is it possible to use it as an inner function within Python or R? Or no? Yes, I think, I mean, I think the, the easier, the easier way would be to... Use Python? To, to use this, so basically use Python from, from Julia from the mm -hmm. Julia side, so you can have your inner function in Python, and then, as I showed here, you could load. I don't know why it's not working. So you could basically you can you can just call you could call your your Python functionalities from inside the Julia. Yeah, but package. it's not possible from Python to use uh, this package yeah, as an inner we function. I haven't done that yet, but if okay. there's if there's interest, um, then yeah, yes. of course. <laughs> so what you can always um, do is um, just open the the ZAR file in both um, Python and uh, Julia, right? So at the end, it's um, just a file format which is compatible, and there's uh, multiple languages uh, you can use um, for accessing. But I think you can call every language from every language now, by now. Sort yes. of all the pairs, all the directions are there. Um, but I had a question, what was it? Ah, yeah, the, 
function is missing what what does it do what is the missing value in julia i thought it doesn't didn't have missing values uh, the missing value is missing your it's is, missing function yes, the, the missing value in julia is missing so there's a function um uppercase missing uh, and yeah. um, a type which is the miss which can be the missing value and then you can filter for that by the is missing so it's similar to an nr in na in r so it's I a it's, it's, it's not available it's a reserved function or it's really it's a, it's really a, a flag it's a type okay it's, it's a, a reserved okay. type which just flags that this is missing so and then you can filter by this skip missing okay. or is missing yeah. nice yeah. Good. So basically there's, there's this difference um, between something that is just undefined or something which we've tried to measure it but actually missed um, I was curious about the, the name, yet another X-ray-like uh, uh, package. And so what are the other packages that are available in Julia? And There's, why? There has been, there are multiple packages in Julia which provide this, um, basically the name dimensions with some value as, as indexing. And the name came up when a few years ago we we had this, and then there was there's multiple packages, and it was like yet another XOA like package. Um, we are currently in the Julia ecosystem. The Julia ecosystem. So we, I spent a lot of time in the last year to um, switch our internal functionality to another package, which does this um, name dimension stuff. So not this one. What? Another, another one. Not no, uh, one of the existing ones. Ah, okay. in, in, so to get rid of one of one of them, basically. To, so it's called dimensional data. But so there's 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 some overlap between functionality in in the junior packages, and this is still basically figuring it out how how to best how best to do things. And um, but we basically switched our internal. Um, representation of name dimensions and so on. But what Yaxoes provides mostly this um, functionality of easy parallelization and this map cube function functionality where you can just apply arbitrary input to arbitrary output. And yeah. I'm thinking we are in the similar direction like um, in the database world a couple of decades ago where we have different um, SQL databases and um, they try to make a standard um, so you can at, at least achieve the basic functionality through all of this um, system and since the data cubes and especially data cubes in Julia are quite new um, they're just trying to find a consensus um, currently um, to make a standard um, so we do not need um, different uh, packages. I also have one question. Uh, is your package also providing some like a uh, community platform in order to have any issues and problems? Like normally, in a, I'm also like a little bit intermediate using the Julia, yes. but uh, especially if I'm facing any problem, sometimes do not find a lot. I mean, like the solutions on it. So are you guys are also developing some platform, not only for this package, or if you are specifically working on the specific package? So the, the, the easiest is to do just use GitHub. OK. So if you, if you have any problems, I think there should be discussions open. No. And maybe I should. Maybe we should open the discussions tabs. Hmm. But at least otherwise, just open an issue, and then we can, we can look into it. And right. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, just like a practical question, so like, I mean, whether you use like Xray on Dask or Yaxray, I mean, I think the chunking is very important. Uh, so how do you guys decide on the chunk sizes? Do you have any like rough thumb or you just like look at, okay, how much memory I can allocate my data to and then I decide on the chunking mm -hmm. or you do like chunking before? Like knowing actually like how much memory you can allocate to uh, uh I mean to kind to of like processing, yeah. right? So yeah, I think, I think we have a like similar issue whether it's like X-ray or like uh, EXA, right? So the chunking is very important. Yes, so I think it depends a bit. So um, for example, I 
for the for the study I'm going to present on Friday, I did not rechunk anything because I mean this was sent in one data which was provided in map layers, but I wanted to test whether it also kind of works for because I didn't want to rechunk the whole uh, data Sentinel One data of Europe, and um, but I think if you have smaller data, um, it might be feasible, and and you know that you're going to apply a lot of time series analysis and doing it over and over again because you're basically experimenting with the data, then it might be good to actually pay the cost up front and just do it once and then and also as I as I showed in the beginning it might be good to have this mixed chunking of not a full map and also not a full time series but this in between so that you have this these boxes which are basically costly in both di in, in both dimensions but there's a good over a, a good trade-off um, between them because otherwise you're going to pay a lot of for one of the dimension axes.